Everybody. Welcome. Need just a few lights here. Ta da! Happy Wednesday. A little bit later this Wednesday, but had a few things that got in the way. And thinking kind of post coronavirus, I would sure love to try to continue doing these live broadcasts. So trying to figure out a schedule that's going to work for me and you know it may change uh, as as a lot of us go back to work and we're not all working from home 100 percent of the time it's the only reason i can manage to pull this off and be here at five o'clock is i was here all day so um little quick sound check everybody hear me okay make sure that uh, um, the little bouncing audio on my end that looks good sounds good on your end of things i'm going to be talking about spoke shapes today if you hadn't already figured that out so let me grab some spoke shapes and some wood. Wood would be good. How about some cherry, some mahogany, and this will work for now, I think. Okay, got one thumbs up on the sounds good. So um, what I'm going to do today is just kind of do a general 101 overview of spoke shapes. I put out a question on uh, social media and I got, I got a lot of responses and I got a lot of very different responses, but the, the one that I got the most responses of was in spoke shapes. Certainly there's plenty of stuff to talk about for future weeks, so um, if you threw out something there, I did read them all. Uh, stay tuned for, for future weeks. But for spoke shapes, this is, this is my favorite tool. I mean, if you look at uh, the Renaissance Woodworker logo on my website, it's got a spoke shave on it. <laughs> this has been kind of the, the tool that I've used to define my hand tool woodworking because it is the tool that really got me thinking about hand tools. Uh, I built a Windsor chair in a classic woodcraft. Whew, 1999 maybe? Maybe it was 2000, I can't remember. And it was my first exposure to um, the spoke shape, but it was also my first exposure to a project that was built entirely by hand. I'd certainly messed around with hand planes and things before, but never had I built something from a log to a chair without ever once plugging anything in. And while we did some draw knife work, we did some ads work, uh, some chisel work, it was the spoke shape that truly was transformative for me. Um, being able to take something that had been split out of a log and shape it into a finish ready spindle was really, really cool. And I just kind of took to using the spoke shave and it launched the ship, if you will. It sent me down the rabbit hole and everything was over for me. And I was pretty much a hand tool guy from then on. Probably within two years, I had sold my table saw. So this is maybe this is more of a warning. This is a caveat emptor. If you start using spoke shaves, you could turn into a freak like me and just have sold off, you know, thousands of dollars worth of power tools. But the spoke shave, I mean, it's a hand plane, right? It's it's a hand plane. It's got a blade that is held fixed at an angle in a body. Now you're going to find variations on spoke shaves. Some of them are going to be more hand plane like than others. The one that I was just showing is a. Um, a Lee Nielsen, one of the Boggs spoke shapes. And it is much more like a hand plane. Veritas shaves are much more like a hand plane because there is an actual sole and the blade projects down from the sole just like a hand plane. And in a lot of ways, it works kinda like a hand plane. Other instances where you have like a low angle shave, this is a Veritas low angle shave. This is a wooden low angle shave made by Caleb James. I've got a couple of wooden vintage low angle shaves that uh, basically look just like these guys. 
In this instance, the sole of this particular plane is the, the blade. The blade is what's sitting on the bottom, but this is used a little bit differently. You don't just set the sole on the wood and shave like you would with this more hand plane like this guy requires a little bit more finesse. And I guess that's really the word of the day and probably one of the things that allowed me to fall in love with the tool because it is so much a finesse tool. It is, it can be set very rough and it can be used to hog off a lot of material. But honestly, if you're trying to remove a heck of a lot of material, this guy is probably more your tool of choice. The draw knife in the coarse medium, I just did some spring cleaning and used a blower in my shop. So I'm finding that there's little bits of dust on all of my tools that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, in the, the continuum of coarse, medium, and fine, this is definitely your coarse tool. Now a skilled person can create a very fine, refined, finish ready surface with a draw knife. But a lot of times, once you've roughed something to shape with a draw knife or roughed its shape with an ax, the spoke shave can come in and clean it up. And that's a very key point because I hear of a lot of people who struggle with a shave and they say they get a lot of chatter. Um, a lot of times, sharp fixes everything, right? If the blade is starting to get dull, that will start to chatter. But more often than not, I find that people are trying to not only take too heavy a bite, but too big, too wide of a bite. The, even though this blade is, what is this, about one and a half inches wide, it's not necessarily designed to take a one and a half inch wide shaving. Now it can with a very light cut, but anything heavier than very light, we're talking smoothing plane shavings, this guy will chatter. It's really not designed for a full width shaving, but rather it's meant to be taken at an angle and shave off a corner and shave off a corner. And put bluntly, if we were to go work through typical hand planes, and if I wanted to hog off a bunch of material, I'm gonna use a heavier mass plane like this four plane. I've got a radically cambered iron on the bottom that curvature of the iron creates a scooping action, which not only reduces tearing, but it also makes it easier to scoop out big, heavy shavings. The longer sole, eh, that's kind of nice, but it's more the mass that I like for removing the heavy amounts of material. The scrub plane is a much smaller plane, but it's got an even more radically cambered iron. So you go with the smaller plane because it can get into those hills and valleys, but that radically cambered iron is what allows you to take those heavy scooping cuts. As we start to move into finishing, smooth planing, we get down to smaller planes, certainly because we like them to ride through the hills and valleys, but we don't need a huge amount of mass in order to lift up a shaving because we're taking finer shavings. This is more of a refining tool. While I can use a number four to go from a rough sawn board to finish ready surface, it's a lot more work and it's actually gonna be a lot more difficult to rely upon this tool, especially something like this Lee Nielsen, which frankly is tuned to take really, really fine shavings. The mouth is so tight on it. I, while I could move back the frog off, open up the mouth, it's kind of a little silly to try to do that. You get down to a number two, this happens to be one of my smoothing planes of choice these days because the sole is so small. I really, if I try to take a heavy cut with this, it's just difficult because there's so little mass to this thing and it just is really meant for refining. So if I have a surface that isn't already flat and I try to flatten it with this little guy, it's a lot of work. Likewise, if you have a surface that is curved or abnormally shaped and you want to deal with the, the shorter sole or the shorter wheelbase of a spoke shave and it's not already flat, you're going to have trouble. You're gonna to have to work a lot more to get a full length shaving, to fare a curve with this little shave. Now, this is what I call my smoothing plane of spoke shaves. Again, this is a Lee Nielsen Boggs flat bottom shave. It has a super, super tight mouth. It takes, it basically cuts tear out free against the grain, with the grain, whatever. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Sundays, it cuts with it without tear out. I kind of leave it that way, set up like a smoothing plane. If I actually want to remove more material, I have a vintage Stanley 152 that I do for that. And I've actually got this set up to take a heavier cut on the left side than it does on the right side. In other words, the blade is at an angle to the sole and I can hog off on one side and kind of slowly transition to a finer cut by moving more to the right side of the blade. This is still a very small tool, small wheelbase, small mass, 
And if I try to take a super heavy cut, it's going to give me trouble. Again, if you're really trying to remove material fast, I go to a draw knife or I go to an ax. Or possibly there are hybrid iterations in between. This is another Caleb James tool. This is what he calls what's his monster shave. This is specifically a Windsor chair making tool. This is great for dealing with the bottom, the, the, the chamfer on the bottom of Windsor chairs. Really why I like this more than anything is the size of the blade. Now what I said before about why you're not necessarily trying to take a full width shaving across this blade, you are taking a little bit off one side, a little bit off the other. This bigger blade still allows you to take a pretty hefty shaving, um, uh, hefty width shaving, not so much thickness of shaving. But this added mass, this added size is better for creating a wider chamfer on the bottom of Windsor chairs. This is a very specific use tool, but you can see because it's designed to take a bigger, in other words, wider cut, we make the whole tool wider, more massive. Trying to take the same kind of refining a single facet uh, chamfer on the bottom of a Windsor chair seat with this guy versus this guy, and let's just, I mean, both the same plane maker, you can see, same shape and everything. This, it can be done with this little guy, but it's so much more work and so much harder to get a consistent facet with this little shave as compared to this big guy. So it's just, like hand planes on a lot of respects where you're adjusting the size, not so much the size of the shave, but the, the, the refinement of the shave in order to hog off material or to act like a smoothing plane. So it's important that you understand that really, no matter what kind of spoke shave work you do, you're really not going to be necessarily shaping a surface or sculpting a surface. You're ref finding the surface that's already kind of part way there. It's not to say that you can't, certainly. You can do anything you want with a spoke shave. The place in the continuum though is more medium to fine rather than being a coarse tool. So right off the bat, if you find yourself struggling with the shave and finding that you're not able to get it to cut, you're getting a lot of tear out, you might be asking more of this little tiny tool than what it was really designed to do. So that's kind of the first point. And I bring that up because I see people all the time with the spoke shave, especially this Boggs Lee Nielsen one, trying to like you know, move mountains with it. And this is, this tool is elegant. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lightsaber for a more uh, elegant time. Um, sorry, I went Star Wars on you. So the first thing we need to talk about, I said it earlier, sharp fixes everything, right? So I need to go over the sharpening bench and show you how I sharpen these little blades which as I talked about with scrapers and any of my sharpening um, diatribes, rants at this point is because I've now moved to freehand, this is really not that difficult. But the good news is spoke shave blades can be a great gateway into freehand sharpening. There are lots of little jigs and things that you can add onto your honing guide in order to allow you to sharpen your spoke shave blades. But I urge you to throw those aside and just try sharpening your spoke shape blades freehand. Because they're so small, you'll find that the whole thing's a lot easier. Now, um, as I move over there, I do just, the folks that are new to this stream, I'm the only one here, I'm the one monitoring the chat room as well, so please ask questions. Um, do me a favor if you can, put the questions in all caps, it makes it so much easier for me to find them amongst the, uh, the chatter that's going on in there. So. Um, for instance, Daniel. Hey, Daniel, um, hand tool school apprentice. Welcome. <laughs> little little marketing plug there. Uh, would you recommend building your first spoke shave out of Woodcraft or purchase a quality brand? Um, well, you can build your first spoke shave anywhere. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be at Woodcraft. I actually have a video that's super, super old. In fact, I'm not even going to recommend going and watching it because it's so old, it's before HD existed. So you'll probably get irritated by like the 320p quality of the video. But I used the Veritas kit to build a low angle shave. Where is that? Oh, that's at my, uh, my northern shop. Uh, it's in my in-laws place in the toolbox up there. Um, but it's, it's this style of shave um, with the blade kit and everything. I don't see any problem doing that. That was not my first shave. That was probably my third shave. Um, still use it today. Um, learned a lot in making it. Making a spoke shave is dirt, simple, easy. I prefer that Veritas kit. I think Ron Hawk has a kit as well now. Um, I like the Veritas one just because it's got the, um, the thumb screw tightening adjustment. It's a little bit easier than some of the 
real vintage ones that just have a blade with two little spears that you know go into like a tapered hole in the body a little bit harder to adjust that way whereas the screw lockdown mechanism is a little bit easier to play with i think it's a great idea as far as the other part of your question building versus buying a quality shave i don't i mean this is a great spoke shave this lee nielsen is a great spoke shave it's incredibly well balanced this is a cadillac of spoke shaves does that still apply the ferrari of spoke shaves i don't know um, it's very well balanced but it is a smoothing plane this is never ever going to be designed to take a heavy cut i like to have this around for like a final pass to get that finish ready surface but honestly this is my workhorse a vintage stanley 152 151 you guys know i'm terrible at stanley numbers it's a vintage stanley shave these guys can be had so easily in antique shops, eBay, hyperketon.com, jimbodytools.com. All these places will have a bunch of these things. If they're not listed, email the vendor. They probably got a shoebox full of them. They're practically a dime a dozen. They are the jack plane of spoke shaves. And they're super easy to tune up. Because the sole is so tiny, it's really easy to flatten that surface. And honestly, it's not even that important to have the heel of the tool that flat. You want maybe the front flat, and even then, it doesn't have to be that flat because nine times out of 10, as I will show you shortly, we're never really referencing the entire width of the sole. We're referencing maybe the width of my finger at a time as we make a cut. So it, it is, this can be had for a fraction of what the Lee Nielsen shave is, but I do think you're eventually gonna wanna go here, just like you would eventually have a, a nice smoothing plane because this thing is super fantastic so useless because i can still create a convex surface with a straight blade now the convex blades that create a concave surface can be a lot more valuable but these again can be kind of fiddly to play with and i i bought this specifically for chair making and honestly i don't even actually use it all that much the other thing you need to look at with shaves and then i will go to the sharpening bench is the sole profile this is another Lee Nielsen bog shave, but this is the round bottom shave. The crazy thing is you'll, you'll see there's a bit of marker on my blade because that says C for curved and this says S for straight. Because if you were to look at these in profile, and I, it's kind of difficult to get the, the camera angle just right, but they really don't look all that different. <laughs> this one, is the straight sole, this one is the curved sole. It's not like it's a radically curved sole, it's more kind of gently eased in the front and the back, um, but it can be beneficial on a tighter radius curve, but these also can be even more fiddly to work with. They require a little bit more finesse. I will get to that. Let's move over to the sharpening bench and go from there. Make sure I didn't miss another question here. Uh, da, 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 da. sharpening bench so i'm going to sharpen both my lee nielsen blades my vintage stanley blade because they kind of all need it and i will sharpen my veritas low angle my um, Caleb Jeans blade was just sharpened, so there's really not much to be done there. Oh, ever since I built that paper towel holder, I mounted it on the other side of the shop. I actually need to build another one and put it next to my sharpening bench because I keep going over here for paper towels. And I keep realizing that I moved the towel holder. Because this... Um, the top to my sharpening bench has become so encrusted with grinding wheel grit and swarf and everything. I really don't like setting blades directly on it anymore, which is another reason why I finally need to get off my butt and build my new sharpening station with that stainless steel top because it'd be so much easier to clean. But anyway, let's try to get a little more light on the surface here. So what I'm going to do is just demonstrate briefly how I go about sharpening these. And I say briefly because it's exactly the same way that I use to sharpen a chisel or a plain blade or anything like that. As I said, I just blew out all the dust in my shop. So I'm just trying to clear
clean off the dust on my stones here. So the reason that I say these are great tools for a gateway into freehand sharpening is because they're so short. They have such, uh, such little um, leverage, I guess is the word I'm looking for. A longer blade will be a lot tippier. These Lee Nielsen ones are fantastic because the blade is super thick. If you look at this vintage shaves compared to the Lee Nielsen one, there's quite a bit of difference in thickness there. And because of that, the bevel is quite a bit wider. So it, this is not a hollow ground bevel. In other words, it doesn't have a concavity. It wasn't ground on a stone. This was actually the flat grind that came from Lee Nielsen when I bought it years ago. But still, because it's so short and because the blade is so thick, that really wide bevel just drops into place really firmly. And I can very easily control it on the stone. Now you'll notice the first thing that I do is I don't pull straight back. I could and go straight forward, but that is wanting to pull the blade away and rock back on the heel. I will always skew the blade on anything that I freehand because what that does is kind of acts like an outrigger or training wheels, if you will. While the blade wants to tip on its bevel this way, if you skew it but continue to pull straight back, the skewed angle of the blade acts as that, that outrigger to prevent the blade from tipping on you. And I can very easily feel that bevel and work until I have a burr. See, I, I mean, it's that fast to pull up that. The blades are so small, you'll find that they're really easy to control. There's the burr. Swipe the burr off. And I will end up stropping that as well, but um, I'll do that in just a minute. Now, this vintage blade is like half the thickness. So the bevel is quite a bit smaller. Still, it's pretty easy to feel the bevel. This has been hollow ground, so that makes it a little easier to feel the bevel. And because the blade itself is so short, there's not quite so much cantilevered weight wanting to pull it off the blade. Still, skewing it, and notice I'm not skewing and working across the blade like that, because that still is working in the direction of the bevel. I'm skewing it and continuing to work in the same direction as the long axis of the stone. And here, because it's a little bit harder to feel that bevel, what I will do is actually kind of more move from my ankles. I'm trying to keep my arm, my wrist, my hand, my arm, my elbow, and everything pretty much in place, not moving. And I'm just kind of stepping forward and stepping back in order to hold that on the stone. But again, it's so easy to feel it because it's such a tiny little blade. You can actually improve your chances of getting a better freehand grind here, freehand hone, I should say, by actually lowering the bevel angle. This is set at 25 degrees. Um, you could actually go down to 20 on a shave like this because you aren't really going to be taking super ginormous shavings off of this. So the durability, the lack of durability that comes from a lower bevel angle is okay in this instance. And that 20 degree angle will actually uh, widen up the, uh, the surface quite a bit here, the surface area of your bevel. Here, I kind of like to move in circles. I don't know why. I feel like I just have better control over it because I don't have a longer stone to play with. If I just go in a circular motion, I feel like I can move a little faster. Just wanna feel that burr. Swipe that off and we're good to go here. So this is basically the same type of blade, but the key difference is the vintage shave is quite a bit thinner and it's a lot harder to feel. If you have um, a Veritas shave or a Lee Nielsen shave, or if you've bought a, uh, a Ron Hawk kit, they're gonna have this thick blade on them and you'll find that it's just basically dead simple. I mean, you can really feel the bevel on this blade so easily. I don't even know that I needed to go back to this finer stone. Probably could have gone straight to my extra, extra fine here but oh well, it's not like it's taking that long, right? So 
I'm just feeling for that little burr there. Can't really, maybe I'm feeling it. And that's one of those things. If you think maybe I feel it, keep working. It should be obvious that there is a burr. And sometimes you actually can see it. You can actually pull it off on your finger like I did there. Or sometimes you can drop the, the blade on the stone and pull straight back and you'll see the burr come off. The key is that you're honing it off and not necessarily breaking it off. Like we talked about with the scraper last week, if you break it off, you can sometimes be left with a ragged edge. Now this brings up the low angle blade. And this is even easier because this is even smaller. And look at the width of the bevel on that. I mean, that's a huge bevel to the point where it's almost equal to the flat on here. So if I set this on my stone, and push it up, the surface tension of the stone and the, the Windex on there is practically holding it at that bevel angle. It's just ridiculous. So this is even easier. Um, Veritas, when you buy that shave, I believe they even have a little attachment that allows you to hone it. Like I said, it wants to be at this bevel angle. And you can kind of go crazy here. So. The low angle shaves, I feel, are a great entry into spoke shaves. If you don't own a spoke shave at all, it is the most versatile shave, and I'll show you why in just a minute. So it can be a great place to start. The hard part about this blade is it's so small that it often sticks to the uh, the stone and can be a little hard to move. A little more lubricant helps. Yeah, I mean, you can come up with all kinds of ways to hold this in a honing guide. Attaching it to a, sacri uh, a sacrificial block, supplemental block or something. But I don't know, I just feel like, I feel like free handing is kind of a natural progression in the path of a woodworker. Um, and this is just a great way to get a feel for it because it's so easy on these little blades. Okay, that one's ready to go. So that's it. That's sharpening a spoke shape blade. There really is very little to that. It's exactly the same as any uh, chisel, plain blade, just easier because they're such small little blades. So, go back here. Um, Veritas for a Lee Nielsen spoke shave. Any pluses or minus with either? I personally am not a fan of the Veritas. Uh, Veritas low angle, absolutely. But the Veritas shave that looks like this, it's got little um, thumb wheel adjusters at the top. I don't particularly like those adjusters. I find them a little fiddly and they're too easy to get the blade um, skewed, which granted, I, I do like my blade skewed on my vintage uh, tool here, but I don't know. I just find that they're a little too fiddly. The um, Lee Nielsen just has got a, a better feel to the whole thing. Um, I don't think Lee Nielsen makes a low angle shave, so there's no contest when it comes to Veritas there. Um, yeah, just the, the bog shaves and Lee Nielsen are just so incredibly well balanced. They are, they are a game changer, I think, over the Veritas ones. Um, how much of a curve on the sole matters? I believe the Veritas one is more curved than the Nielsen. I mean, the more, the tighter the radius of the curve, the tighter the radius of the curve that you can shave. So when you've got a, a concave surface and it's a really tight radius, the the lesser curvature of the Lee Nielsen shave will have some trouble getting in there. I have found though that it's not that big of a difference with this type of shave. Um, when you start to get into really curved surfaces, no spoke shave is really gonna work and you end up using a different tool. Um, the low angle shaves can go into really tight radii and that's why I find these to be very 
useful tools because the blade itself is right there on the bottom. So uh, yes, technically it does make a difference. The amount of curvature in the sole does make a difference, but not so much that I would really worry about it. It's not really uh, a, a game changer as far as do I choose this one over this one. Um, the, somebody said, how about sharpening the round blades? Um, the vintage Tang blades or something like a Travisher. Um, it's a different operation. This is a Travisher, but it's got a curved blade on the bottom. The only, the, the way I sharpen that is exactly how I just did it. But instead of moving, um, kind of back and forth to the blade, I turn the long axis of the blade so that it's parallel to the long axis of the stone and I rock back and forth. So I'm working along the edge and back, along the edge and back. It's the same way that I sharpen my scrub plane blades, my four plane blades. So um, yeah, it's relatively easy to do. And really, I don't, again, I don't know another way to sharpen that with a jig. Maybe a Tormek. I'm not really tightening these things up at this point, just getting them back into the shaves because setting them up is kind of key. I've actually got a couple of videos on my um, website that talk about this. Uh, Rob says, is there advantage or disadvantage to hologram for the spoke shape? Not really. I mean, it's the same thing that would show up with anything. You can feel the blade a little bit easier with a hologram, but because the blades are so small, not really. I mean, if you are really struggling with freehand sharpening, put a hollow grind on. It's only going to make it easier to feel. Okay, I need a piece of paper. So, and I probably should move my camera so that I can get a closer view of this stuff. Honestly, the spoke shave is a pretty simple tool. So there's not a lot of things to think about when it comes to, do I buy this one or do I buy that one? Um, you're gonna end up with multiple <laughs> in the long run. I can, I can guarantee that right now. I mean, I've actually uh, sold more shaves than I have now because I just thought I, I have a bit of a problem or, because I do like spoke shaves so much. Oh, uh, you know what? I didn't strop the, the blades. Um, I'll be okay. I strop them exactly the same way as I just did them on the stone, but uh, I'm, since they're already in their, uh, their bodies, I'm not gonna take them out again. So the um, Lee Nielsen shave is set up Pretty straightforward, uh, which tool would you use where the spoke shave doesn't get because of the tight curve? Uh, a rasp, um, a rasp, a carving gouge, a chisel, um, an in shave possibly, or a scorp. Any of those tools would do it depending upon the size of the surface, the size of the, the width, when I say the size, the actual width of the cut that you're trying to make. Um, a chisel works great hold the sucker bevel down and it will, it will manage any curve. Carving gouge, same way. If you've got a bent back carving gouge, it gets even tighter. Um, but if it's, if it's really tight and if it's over a smaller surface, sometimes just grabbing a rasp is a great way to go. Um, or I would use one of these guys. In fact, let's go ahead and set this up for that. Well, first things first, I want to set the forward and back projection of this blade. So what I've always done is to take a piece of paper and uh, shove it in there between the fence, this is the fence, and the edge. And I tighten it down. One thing with this Veritas low angle shave is you might find, certainly when you first get it, you wanna take the blade out and you wanna make sure that any Rust prohibitive is off the blade. Wipe this thing down thoroughly with mineral spirits because there'll be some grease on the sides that will make this want to slip. 
um, no matter how much you tighten these little thumb screws down and you really, this is a toolless operation. You should not be needing a wrench to tighten these down. First of all, it's gonna tear up the brass on here. Um, so if there is still that lubricant, it will allow the blade to slip back because it's directly opposite the force of the cutting action. Second of all, if you're still finding some slippage, you can rough up these edges. This blade has, a, has a, like a dovetail angle on it. You can rough that up with like some 80 grit sandpaper and you won't have any problems anymore. So now I've got the blade not only set with a mouth opening, a very fine mouth opening, but also using the piece of paper, I can set the blade so that it's parallel to this fence. And why I like this Veritas shave is because now the depth of cut is set by raising and lowering this fence. And I can set it at an angle so that I'm taking a light cut on one side and a heavier cut on the other. Or in this case, I can set it so that I'm taking almost, I'm taking no cut on the far side and it extends down to a heavy cut on the other. So you get kind of a continuum of cutting there, which can be really beneficial. You can go from rough removal all the way Fence gives you a reference surface in front of things, which is really nice. So I can use the same technique. The blade is set on the bench itself, and I'm going to slide the fence down so that it, make sure you're putting pressure back on the blade because there is a slight angle to the tool. If I push down on the fence, you can see that that shave is rocking forward. It's supposed to do that. So you do want to Firmly apply pressure so that the blade is flat on the bench. Then slide the fence down. And tighten it up. And then I pick it up and really snug it down. So now this is set to take our really light cut. making a curve. There we go. Now I could have done that with a spoke shave, but it would have taken three times as long. Oh, you guys didn't even see that. Dang it. <laughs> Zoom out. I just made a curve with a, with a draw knife. You're just gonna have to trust me. Oh, thanks for bringing that up, Kirby. Um, yeah, YouTube is still working on pre-processing. I heard from them again today. They say everything is working fine on their end, but they're trying to figure out why that scraper thing is not playing. I wish I knew. Um, today I'm taking preventative measures. Normally when I do these live broadcasts, you rely upon YouTube. Um, I'm recording my own copy here. I do not have a copy of the scraper video, so if YouTube can't fix it, I'll just have to do it again at some point. But even then, even if I, if I had a copy, I would have to delete that video and, and upload another one because there is no replace function in YouTube. Brilliant, I know. So I'm hoping that it will be fixed. They say that they can play it and they can see it on their end, but I can't even download it. I can't do anything with it. So it's entirely in YouTube supports hands. It's really frustrating, really annoying. So I am recording my own copy uh, for the future for some weird happens to this one. I can at least upload a new video, but unfortunately I don't have that recourse with the scraper one. But uh, Kirby, you are uh, a hand tool school member and apprentice member. So everything I've talked about with scrapers, I talk about in the archives there. So it's all there. Um, go to the uh, tool library, you'll find videos on sharpening scrapers. Um, and there's videos on using scrapers in several different places in the school. Just search for scraper or go to the index on the dashboard under tools used, use the drop down box and select scraper and you're going to find all kinds of fun stuff. Um, the last thing is I kind of like to use a mallet to adjust these. Yeah. You know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and set this in an angle because that's the way I prefer to work. Um, and I'll tell you why, because it just makes it a lot easier. 
So you can go to great lengths to set this shave up to be exactly parallel to the blade and to take that whisper thin shaving. But if you purposely angle it, now I can take a real heavy cut on one side and a super light cut on the other side to the point where this roughly, we'll just call it hewn surface from the draw knife, I'm actually, I'm getting a cut, but it's not really doing much because I've got to flatten out the facets that I've created. So having the blade set to be heavier on one side, I can now come in and start to refine the facets that the draw knife created. Even here, this curve, you can see this low angle shave can take it. So the important thing is with a spoke shave, specifically a low angle spoke shave, there is the blade flat on the surface of the wood and then there is the cutting angle which is going to be a slight tweak for on. And this is also a fence. This is a tighter radius fence that will work into super tight radii. Even here, this radius, you know, it's who knows what it is, but I'm able to very clearly shave the whole thing. So I try not to block the camera here, but here's the other thing. The spoke shave being a finer tool is not a grab it in your fist type tool. It is a fingertip tool. I'm going to put my thumbs on the fence Put the blade flat on the surface and then rock it forward, that little rock forward until that fence engages. I'm going to keep pressure on my thumbs on that fence and pull the shave. Now as the curvature of the wood changes, the pressure of the fence, the balance point of engagement to cutting and not cutting, rocking it back, it, it's not going to cut. If I rock it forward, it is going to cut. That engagement angle is going to change slightly as the um, the shape of the wood actually changes. So over here, taking a rough cut, I can kind of deepen that curve to the point where like the fence will actually start getting in the way. So that curve I think is probably, we could probably go a little bit deeper there. But now what I have to do is maintain the pressure on this fence throughout the curve. So it's not just a grabbing and, and pulling it and letting, it, letting the blade run down the surface because when the blade is running on the surface, it's not actually cutting. You have to roll it forward to that engagement angle. And this is why that fingertip grip is gonna give you so much more feedback as you pull along the wood or if you push. Now I wouldn't wanna push uphill here because I would tear things out. When I grab it in my fist, I lose that sensitivity of touch. And it's really important to maintain that or, you know, all hell breaks loose, basically. So keep that fingertip grip and feel the feedback of the shape as it's cutting. You will feel where it wants to grab, where it wants to grab, where it wants to skip. Or if you lose that engagement angle and it rocks back, you'll feel it skip as well. The other thing is, it's really hard to take a heavy shaving when you've got this fingertip grip. So if you find that you're having trouble maintaining that grip because it's too hard to pull, A, you may need to sharpen the blade, B, you may be trying to take too heavy of a cut. But you can see I'm able to refine that curve and I'll actually create a convexity here as well. Concave surfaces are actually harder, I think, the convex surfaces because here at least as I'm rolling through that convexity I've got kind of two points of contact on the blade as I as I move down there over the convex concave excuse me convex surface I actually just have that part right in front of the blade that is referencing and I have to really maintain that balance so now you can create that s curve shape and this is a finished ready surface there's absolutely silky smooth ready to go off this shave. I was able to quickly sculpt away. So if we did this again, put a whole bunch of facets all over the wood with a draw knife, I can come back and refine those facets into one facet. and fare that whole thing into a curve. 
Now here, because this board is thin, I mean, this is only about a half inch. Yeah, it's a half inch thick. I can take the shave and I can do one pass with it. You know, I can get the whole surface. It's a different story if I was using something like this. I mean, this is what, five quarter, Jerry? Certainly with something like eight quarter, it's gonna be a very different story. But if I were to trying to shape a curve here and I'm failing. Come on. Lat on here and try to take the entire surface. While it might do that, you're gonna be better off taking a bite down one side and then a bite down the other side. Again, trying to eliminate those facets. And then I'll slowly start to turn the shave around and remove the facet from the top. Remove the facet from the top there. Now I can actually set the shave so that it's perpendicular and working down the face. But now I'm only taking, you can see the size of the shaving that's coming out here is like a third the thickness of the wood. The shaving keeps falling apart on me. But if I wanted to flatten this into one facet, I'm going to be better off just trying to flatten that center third, taking it down until these sealed chamfers on either side disappear. So that's kind of the first usage tip with these shaves is don't try to take it all off in one bite. Take this down to my layout line, wherever that layout line would be, repeat it on this side, and then remove the hump in the middle. The next thing is, is while you may do a lot of this kind of nibbling type work, and this may help you kind of shape the surface, you want to get into the habit as quickly as possible into taking full length passes like this. This goes with the draw knife as well. If you truly want to fare the curve, like we did here, if you take a bunch of shorter passes, you're going to have little bumps and little facets on the curve. Eventually, you're going to want to take that curve all the way in one pass. And that's what happens is you smooth everything out from a rougher surface to a refined surface. You're doing that with that shape. These guys are super flexible in that capacity because you just have to maintain that engagement angle. And because the, they can tackle tighter radii, it makes it really useful on a variety of conve concave, convex curves. Flipping this whole thing around and using the shorter fence, it goes even tighter on the whole thing. That's why this has really been kind of a, a workhorse of mine for you know, probably 20 years now. If we go to the Lee Nielsen, I'll go with the Lee Nielsen shave because it's probably the more, most refined. No, you know what, I'll use the Stanley. Here what I'm going to do is set the sole flat on the work. Now again, unlike the low angle shave, there is no engagement angle. This sole presses firmly onto the bench and there's no rock here. There is no slight forward tilt to the whole thing. So what I do is press it down firmly, press the blade so that it is also making contact with the bench. So it is essentially now parallel to the sole and should be level with the sole. Now what you'll find is that it will actually take a pass and it will take a pretty fine pass at that. So this tool, just by setting it up flush with the bench top like that, it's essentially set into smoothing plane mode. But again, one of the things I like to do is use a, a mallet. <laughs> that was a little too much. <laughs> a little too aggressive. Use a mallet to deepen the cut on one side or you can actually turn it over and just tap it on the bench. I find that this is actually a really good way to make minor adjustments to a plane or a plane. Well, this is a plane to a spoke shape like this. If you find that it's taking too light a cut on one side, like it's taking no cut over there, what I'll do is just tap it. And we're not walloping on the thing. People are immediately like, oh my God, you're abusing that shave. Don't be ridiculous people, it's a tool little tap on the bench and now I'm getting 
I'm getting a cut. I was getting no cut on that side before. Now over here, I can get a super heavy cut and I can get a refined cut so I can refine the surface that I've already created with that heavier cut. Now here, it's a little bit harder to maintain that fingertip grip because of the way the tool is, you know, the, the wings uh, curve up like that. It can be hard. I like to put my fingertips in the, the um, recesses underneath. And what that ends up doing is just kind of, you have to wrap your hand around a little bit more, but I'm definitely not grabbing it in my fists like this. You always have your thumbs on top. And as the geometry, the curve of the wood changes is you have to actually change the tool. You have to kind of scoop your way into those curves. Let's go back to this guy because it's just easier to show since it's a thinner board. So in this case, as I come down this curve and I come around this curve, I can still, I can still make that radius work with this flat bottom shave. So let me also say that I have a round bottom Lee Nielsen shave. I rarely use it. <laughs> I really do. Um, maybe I just don't use that many really, really sharp or, or tight radius circles in my work, but um, yeah. <laughs> Or if it's a really tight radius, it's like over a super small area, like, you know, this wide, and I actually find it to be faster to hit it with a rasp. Or sometimes I've got a tight radius, like I've got on my layout square. This radius here, it doesn't really work because I've got this bead here and I've got to fill it there and they get in the way of the tool. Um, so yeah. I own this and I, you know, I use it, it's nice, but I very rarely use it because the small little sole here allows you to navigate all kinds of curves. So here, as I come down this curve, I've got firm pressure with my thumbs and you can skew the blade just like you would if you're seeing some chatter and difficult grain, you can skew it. Most of the time when you're seeing chatter, it's that you're not maintaining that cutting angle. So while there is no rock forward here, there is kind of, you want to have the pressure almost as if it were leaning forward. This guy, you have to actually lean it forward to get it to cut. This guy, <laughs> this is going to sound very hokey, but you almost have to think like you're leaning forward. In other words, you need to keep constant pressure on the front of the sole in front of the blade, which is why I say the flatness of the heel of the sole is really not that important because all of the pressure is on the front of the, the sole in front of the blade. And that is what I want that fingertip grip, that thumb pressure to actually feel that curve as I'm rolling down it. And you kind of tweak your wrists in order to match that curvature and get a consistent cut. And that was a pretty heavy cut from one end of the curve to the next. So it's all about that, that light, as much as possible, fingertip grip to feel that as it goes through. This is definitely not a just set it and push type thing. You have to feel that wood changing underneath you and it will telegraph the little lumps and bumps and skips that you feel over the edge. Mostly, if you find that you're getting a lot of chatter because the board is thicker, take it off in smaller bites. Take the side, take the side, remove the hump in the middle. That's the, the, the number one probably spoke shave usage tip there. Any other questions? I'm just adjusting the Lee Nielsen one here. So same story with this guy. Set it down on the bench. Press the blade flat. What I like about this tool is it's really easy to press the blade down to its touching and then kind of grab it in the middle and use that, that plate and I just cinch these down lightly and it holds everything in place. And then I can kind of get a better grip on it. And again, no need for a tool here. If you're finding yourself grabbing these with pliers, something's wrong. This is just finger pressure to tighten this up. Now here, it's set for such an incredibly light cut that I'm getting little shavings, but I'm not getting fully 
consistent shaving. So what I'm going to do is start on one edge and the other edge. And this is like moving from a heavier set plane to a lighter set plane. You'll find that it's starting to skip on you until you get that surface refined to the point where I'm expecting a higher tolerance here. While this shave, let's just say this shave was taking a shaving that was three thousandths of an inch thick. This one's taking one thousandth of an inch thick. So a cutting fully across the width. Or let me just give it a slight little tap to adjust it. Okay, so now it's cutting. This particular shave is having a little bit more trouble getting into that inside curve. I'm skipping right there in the middle. Let me just refine this real quick. Let's see if we can pick this up on camera. So, yeah, it's a little bright. Right here, this is so incredibly glass smooth, it's actually shiny right now. Turn down the light so you can see even a little bit better. This is completely polished. The, the quality of the, the surface left behind from that bog shave is an orders of magnitude better than just that Stanley shave. I mean, this is, this is polished and burnished. Um, 400, 600 grand sandpaper couldn't produce a surface like this. Now, because I refined this middle section with the other shave, it's not as noticeable, but the blade was actually skipping from about here to here. The flat bottom of that shave demands even more flatness, so it can't actually handle that inside curve. So there's one thing you could say that Lee Nielsen shave doesn't quite handle the, the steeper, uh, the tighter radii that you would get from even this vintage uh, shave and certainly the low angle shave. But it'll do all kinds of convex curves and all kinds of uh, more mellow curves. So again, you know, it just depends upon the amount of curve that you put in your work. I've never really found a lot of situations where I haven't been able to get this shave to work. What I use this shave for a lot of times is rounding, you know, a square into a dowel or into a cylinder. And in that instance, it's a straight cut or it's a, you know, a, a convex surface like that. It's really very great for that. And it's fantastic once you've shaped it to come back and blend all the facets and give you that incredibly gorgeous polished surface there. Um, questions. That's the setup and usage and sharpening of all of these shaves. The biggest thing I can say that's, that, that's kind of the difficulty in demonstrating these is it's a very touchy-feely tool. It's a very little tool. So don't ask too much of it. Don't try to take monster, monster cuts with it and be very delicate with your grip. You want to really feel what the shave is telling you. If it's chattering, more than likely the engagement angle is wrong and you need to put a little bit more pressure on the front of the shape, or you need to sharpen the blade. So first things first, make sure your blades are sharp. Then you need to just kind of tweak your wrists and apply more pressure with your thumbs on the shape. Now the same thing works if you're pushing, but in that case, once you, when I go from pulling, my thumbs are applying the pressure. When I go to pushing, my first finger applies the pressure. And some of you may find that you're better pushing, you get better feel for it, because what's happening is that forward push is actually rotating the tool into that engagement angle. But technically, as you're pulling, it's also wanting to rotate it. But it, you know, some people, there are times when I just feel a lot better pushing than I do pulling, but I think by default, I prefer to pull the tool. But keeping that delicate grip and not ham fisting it is what's going to fix a lot of those chatter problems, because you're gonna feel when it starts to jump and, and, and not engage the wood properly. And that's, that's why I say it's such a touchy-feely tool. If you're having trouble with it, it's a matter of, of getting the blade sharp and then just spending some time with some scrap wood, working through some curves. 
Um, if you've got a draw knife, it's great because you can hog out a curve real quick and then spend time unifying those multifaceted surfaces into one facet surface. Um, if you're really good with a draw knife and you can create one facet surface, don't do it. You know, purposely make a ratty surface and then focus on practicing with a spoke shave to unify those various facets into one. Next thing would be take off one edge, take off another edge, remove the hump in the middle. Don't try to just come right down the middle with the thing. Um, anything more than about this half inch thick, and honestly, this is cedar too, so it's really soft. Um, what did I give Mark for his birthday? I sent him a text. <laughs> that was it. Uh, did I miss any other questions further up here? I don't think so. So any last questions before I uh, shut this down? I try to keep these things to an hour. A lot of people wanted to hear about spoke shaves. The fact of the matter is, there's not a whole lot to say because it's a relatively simple tool. More You will get gain more out of the spoke shave just spending some time with it. But spend time with a light grip. The light grip is key. Okay. Well then, everybody, I think I will say good evening because uh, that's all I got to say at this point. If you have other questions, feel free to uh, leave them in the comments of this video. I will happily respond to them there. Otherwise, um, tune in next Wednesday. And if you have topping suggestions for next Wednesday, let me know. I'm, I'm all ears. I've certainly got plenty of things to talk about, but uh, I always like to um, address the things that are kind of more immediate in, uh, in your little universes. So have a good evening, everybody. We'll see you later.